All right, welcome to our last lesson of this term. Uh, before I, before I uh, start, I just want to say it was an absolute pleasure to work with you, okay, on, uh, on uh, all that we had. I think, uh, I think we did a pretty good job um, uh, carrying, taking care of the content here. Uh, I'm happy with the progress. Now, as far as the test, um, um, there is go I'm going to release this test either late tonight or early in the morning tomorrow. You're going to have to the rest of the week to complete that, same as the test before. I'm also going to, um, uh, within about an hour of, uh, of this last lecture, I'm going to release assignment number 10. It's, that's, it's going to be quicker than the previous ones. Uh, it's just going to be a bunch of questions to uh, to answer. So um, uh, it's going to be a little. I think it's going to be a little bit easier than the other ones. Nevertheless, uh, you're you you're learning that. So uh, within about an hour after uh, after this class, uh, that assignment last assignment is going to be released. Uh, okay. So the last uh, last lecture of today is is. Uh, we're going to take care of some topics here, analog versus digital, and then ADC versus DAC, microprocessor and microcontroller. Um, we're going to take care of the difference uh, between what is a microprocessor and what is a microcontroller. And we are going to, on the last slide, mention uh, um, the use of the microcontrollers in the uh, in the industry, it's uh, yeah, uh, ADC versus DAC. That uh, stands for analog to digital conversion or digital to analog conversion. Okay, so let's uh, take care of uh, first thing that let's see the difference between an analog and digital um, representation of quantities. Okay, so on uh, on this slide we have two meters. One is two multimeters. One is analog, obviously here with the needle and the scale, and the other one is digital. All right. So and on the top of that says analog and digital. There are two different ways to represent or describe the quantities. Quantities like it could be voltage, could be current. Uh, it could be resistance, it could be impedance, it could be weight, uh, it could be volume, anything can be, or temperature, uh, music, sound. Uh, so, uh, well, different ways to represent or describe, uh, that's not the only way. It should also be a different ways to um, store data. You can store data in an analog version, they can store data in a digital format, right? Well, the good old analog version would be uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it would be the way we used to take photographs, pictures using the film in the camera, if anybody remembers uh, that idea. Uh, so there would be a camera with a film and the light would hit the film and it would just burn itself. Uh, the, sh you know, the grayscale and the colors would burn themselves onto the film in an analog sort of way. There would be no, um, there would be no um, numbers associated with that, uh, any sort of digital representation. Um, another way of analog recording would be uh, if anybody remembers as well, but right now these things are coming back in a big way would be the old, good old uh, vinyl records, right? So uh, uh, the vinyl record would be uh, having a track of, um, of grooves that the needle would ride on and hit in them in a certain way and the sound would be reproduced. Uh, the other way would be the tape, magnetic tape, uh, this, uh, the sound would be recorded on the magnetic tape in an analog way. There would be uh, certain magnetic levels um, embedded onto the magnetic tape and they would be of different strengths 
and it would be just uh, the, the 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 magnetic head that would read the, this thing from the, the the information from the tape it would just sense how strong or how weak the signal is and uh, that's how would uh, it, it would be passing on it would pass on the information to the, to, to further circuitry so it could be amplified and um, and uh, you know set to the output which would be something that's called a loudspeaker uh, a loudspeaker is another name of uh, for, for for the speaker that uh, that produces sound and mind you uh, we're going to touch on something that is called transducers because that term is also going to be used in today's presentation a transducer is a device that converts one form of energy into another right? for example a microphone is a transducer a uh, microphone would <clears throat> would pick up the sound waves uh, and it would convert from the something that's called longitudinal sound waves, uh, which would be the air pressure um, extracting and compressing uh, um, periodically. And that signal would be converted into the electronic form of that signal. All right. So that's a, that would be a transducer. Right? Uh, digital term or a, or a temperature sensor device that would also be a transducer it would sense a temperature in the air uh, and that would convert that information into an electronic signal uh, so a transducer is something that converts one thing from one form to another energy from one form to another that's all there is antenna antenna from like a radio antenna it would be converting uh, if you'll be a transmitting antenna it would be converting a, a electronic or electric pulses or, or waves onto the electromagnetic waves they would just be um, broadcasted over the air so transducer is a device that converts one form of energy onto another okay. now when we we'll go back to this um uh, to this slide here, we see two different uh, versions of a multimeter. One is the analog uh, version of it. Uh, you would have the leads uh, plugged into the digital, uh, sorry, analog multimeter, and it would make the, um, the magnetic element, electromagnetic element right there, uh, the galvanometer, if you will, uh, swing the needle one way or the other, according to the signal that it gets and the needle would just sway maybe halfway maybe three quarters of a way whatever the, uh, the representation of the quantity or the magnitude of the quantity would it be now uh, as opposed to displaying the quantities uh, magnitude in a number version and sometimes sometimes you would prefer one or the other just because uh, the analog equipment was first and then as the technology moved forward then the digital devices came about it doesn't necessarily mean that the digital devices would always be the number one choice for whatever action you want to perform right? sometimes you would prefer the multimeter in the digital version and sometimes you would prefer the multimeter in an analog version all right i'm going to give you an example if you well if this for example if this digital multimeter is properly calibrated which means it actually represents the true values then if you are measuring a quantity like a voltage or current that stays in one place it just doesn't move it, it doesn't go up or down periodically or not uh it 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 would give you a pretty much exact number now is this an exact number right that's another thing <clears throat> If this isn't like, because you can get two different multimeters and measure the same thing and you would get two different numbers. Well, does this thing is just basically, it doesn't mean that this can't be wrong. Of course, this can be wrong. It all depends on how good the circuitry is that is sensing the, uh, whatever, you, whatever you're measuring. And then how good is it in converting that from from the analog form into digital so that comes with the tolerances it comes with you know how expensive parts you're going to use and 
how it was actually made. Right? Now, you're going to see the specific number and you're just going to have to trust that the rest of the circuitry actually conveyed the information properly onto the digital display. Right. So that, you know, just because something gives you a readout in, in the form of a number, uh, doesn't mean it's, you know, the, the you know, the, 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 um, the ultimate thing um, that you cannot be wrong, right? It just, I just want you to know that kind of stuff, right? Now, let's say that this is uh, the circuitry is perfect. Um, then it actually gives you the true representation of, let's say somebody's measuring 24 volts and it actually is 24 volts. Now, uh, depending on how you set it up, uh, is it 24.5, is it 24.3 or is it 24.8? Well, we don't know. I will know which is somewhere between 24 and 25 and it's probably closer to 24 volts. All right. And that's when the quantity, like a current or a voltage, for example, doesn't change. Now, let's say the voltage sits at, um, let's say it sits at 60 volts. And then it just, it has a ripple effect. Uh, it just kind of uh, bounces between 102 and 102 and 95, all right? So it would be very difficult to measure that with the digital multimeter because the digital multimeter would just start counting from 95 to 102 or three and back and forth. And you would just see a bunch of numbers uh, flashing on this display and uh, you would not be able to make out what it actually is because you would try to settle in one way, but you won't be able to. So it's going to try to measure the other thing. You won't be able to see how it behaves. But if you have a needle, that needle would sway a certain way and it would just oscillate between that whatever 95 and 103. So you would be actually be able to look at the needle and tell that yes, it is somewhere around 60 volts and uh, and then it just goes between 95 and 102 okay so that would be a that would be a scenario that uh, you would prefer to see to uh, to um, uh, to use the analog multimeter so for different purposes sometimes you want to use the analog technology and sometimes you want to use the digital technology where digital technology um, stands out the most is the clarity of copying things um, you probably don't remember the situation, uh, in, you know, years ago that uh, uh, people would copy um, cassettes for each other. Right? It would be audio cassettes and there'll be a bunch of songs that will be copied onto a cassette and then you would uh, copy one cassette to another so that the song would be the next copy of that would not be as clear as the first one because you would have the noise added to it, some hissing or some whatever else. And whatever a copy of a copy of a copy, every time you copy that, uh, you would just bring the quality down. Now, when it comes to copying digital information, these are ones and zeros and the information is just enclosed in, um, in, in a digital form. Uh, so it's just a string of numbers and those numbers don't change. So if you make a copy, you get the exact copy of what the original was. And then you make a copy out of that. Why well, you just, just like the original, you copy it. So when you're making copy after copy after copy, then the quality doesn't go down. So that's one of the example when the digital excels over the analog um, well, data storage or copying. Okay. I could get uh, different, uh, uh, different, uh, um, different examples of that. And Jordan says, yes, I do. You remember uh, taping songs of the radio to make your own mixtape uh, with tape dabbing. Yeah, uh, the good old times. There is a bit of a sentiment involved in, uh, in, in some of that. Uh, now, a lot of people still prefer to use the um, vinyl records. Because there's something about that turntable that you put that black vinyl record on that, you put the needle on it, and it just sounds different 
than the digital. Is it better quality or not? Maybe that's not the question. Maybe it's the way it is, uh, uh, it is presented. Uh, same as the solid state MOSFETs uh, uh, amplifiers, they are the cleanest ones that, of them all. But uh, a lot of people still choose to have the guitar tube amplifiers for their guitars because, yes, it distorts a little bit, but maybe these tubes that, uh, um, that, uh, that are being used in the preamplifiers for the guitar, maybe they distort it the proper way, right? So it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're all humans and it's the technology as, is only as good as it can serve us, you know, for, uh, for, you know, for as far as the philosophical aspect of that. And yeah, tape dabbing, uh, yeah, sometimes there will be a button on the, uh, sometimes you will have ghetto blasters. Uh, uh, you will have uh, two cassette packets in, uh, uh, in, in those, and you could tape from one tape to another, and there will be also a button that you could press that it would, uh, it would do it twice as fast. So we just turn this, you, can, you couldn't listen to that because it would be just like, you know, the, uh, the, the, the mice talking. Um, or chipmunks talking, right? Uh, so uh, uh, then, uh, but then uh, this, the, 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 the tape could be dubbed uh, twice as fast with the quality slightly down, right? But anyways, back to the analog versus digital uh, situation here. So yeah, so sometimes you would choose to have a digital um, measuring equipment uh, or digital equipment, and sometimes you would choose the analog. And I just gave you the example of, uh, of, of both. Why would you choose one over the other? Now, uh, analog versus digital. Analog and the digital. Too. So uh, it's, I just carried on this description from the previous slide. So here's a waveform. Let's say this is a sound. Now, uh, this would not be a very pleasant sound to listen to for a long time because it's just a sound wave. And it just sounds more like, right? You know, after a while, your ears are going to hurt. But uh, but we're not going to make a proper uh, uh, well, proper sound because usually when you when you come to uh, when it comes to um, where is that um, the music that I was playing for you? Come on, come on, come on! Here it is. All right? I just do the uh, sound forge thing here. So basically, the, the sound waves, they look like this. Right? And that's something that you can actually listen to. So this is, uh, this is a software that's called SoundForge. And you can see here, this is an analog form of a sound wave, but it is registered and recorded in a digital form. Now, when I stretch it a little bit, Let's see, let's get some bigger signal here. There we go, all right. Uh, now you can see if I keep magnifying it, then at some point you're going to see those little dots. These would be the samples. And this digital form of the signal is only as good as the resolution, as the digital resolution of the signal how many times per second can you sample that and record that? And then you just connect the dots, All right? So this would be an analog version converted into a digital way for storage purposes and then reproduction. That's what sound, is, sound waves look like, but, <clears throat> but here. Yeah. Uh, just for the simplicity purposes, we're going to have a sine wave. Now, how many times can you sample things and record that and then reproduce that just by giving the numbers and the numbers you can give as levels. This is the um, decimal representation of just for the, uh, uh, you know, so we can have an e easier way to explain. Uh, so you would have, if, you, if this would be the X axis and this would be the Y axis. So this would be the time and this would be the levels. And how many times can you chop that waveform into things? That would be the digital resolution. Um, and how many times you can actually stop and 
sample that and then reproduce it. So this would be level 12, level 39, 63, 78, 82, 70, and just, you know, so yeah. So uh, now you can convert those numbers into binary format and you're going to have the strings, long strings of ones and zeros, right? When you convert that into the binary format. So this is basically the conversion of the analog signal into a digital form. And we do that by sampling it. Now, when it comes to, for example, things like a vinyl record, it also has certain type of a resolution. You can, you can only, it depends on the material that's being used, in this case, vinyl. And it just depends how precise you can engrave those grooves into that, uh, into that track. You can only go so much. That also depends on the size of the needle. Right? Uh, when it comes to analog, you can only go. You can only. You can only go down with the resolution or up with the resolution. You can only go so much, and that will be dictated as far as the materials will let you. Right? Now, when it comes to digital resolution, it is dictated by the sampling rate. And that also is dictated by the quality of equipment. Some of the equipment are able, some of the equipment um, devices uh, are able to, uh, to sample things a lot and very fast. So it depends on the, um, on the resolution or the input resolution of the, uh, um, of the, of the equipment how fast they can recognize the change um, and uh, how much memory you have to store that because the more numbers you produce you have to have something to store this thing with right uh, so uh, so here's the yeah so here's the, um, the, the, the and now you can convert analog into digital and then if you have something to read those samples you can convert it back to analog because what would be the point of recording music into a digital format if you can't convert it back to listen back to it, right? Uh, so, uh, so here it is. How do we convert digital to analog? By sampling per time. Right? And how many samples can you get? That depends on the number of bits that you can have, all right? Now, analog ADC, analog to digital conversion or analog ADC, analog to digital converter. This is described as the bridge between the sensors or otherwise known as transducers and the, and it's here, the computer systems or the digital equipment. So on, on the left side here, you have the sensors and transducers. So sensor would be a microphone membrane and the transducer would be the circuitry that converts, that is able to sense that sensor and convert that into an electronic signal. Okay. And you're going to have some sort of a resolution, like if you're, if, if you're doing the uh, five volt system, uh, then uh, like TTL, for example, we go from zero to five. Uh, so this would, sense and this sensor and transducer would sense the signal would feed that into the digital conversion box and the analog levels will be converted to numbers by sampling them over time per time and then it would be pushed on to the digital system, like a computer system, right? whatever that is. Okay, so that would be the ADC stands for analog to digital converter. Okay, now here's a bit of a, uh, a bit of a um, diagram or graph. Over here, that's not time, that's volts. So this is from zero to five volts. And look here, this, there's no unit here. This is just number. These are just numbers from zero to 255. Hmm. 
Let's see that. And here is, a, is an interesting statement. It's a digital output and it says eight bit. And let's just take a look at something here, guys. I'm going to call up a calculator. Can we see it? Yes, I think we can see it. All right, so where is the, uh, okay. So let's say two to the power of two, and it's going to be going give us four. Wow, magic, right? Okay, so let's cancel that. Let's go two to the power of eight. Ooh, 256. Hmm. Isn't it interesting that this is from zero to 255? Well, two to the power of eight gives us 256 possible combinations. Now, this is going to give us the magnitude from zero to 255. So it's going to be one, two, three, four, uh, until you count to 255. So you're going to have the highest number is going to be 255. But the zero is also a state. It's not nothing. So there's going to be one more combination when all zeros. So altogether, it's 256. Right? So if you have 8-bit digital converter, uh, then we're going to have 256 possible samples over the, whatever the period of time that we choose to sample that. So here is our digital resolution. It's an 8-bit, okay? Now, uh, you can convert sound, you can convert uh, light as photography, as far as photography is concerned. You can convert pretty much any kind of information and then present that as numbers. And as long as something else can understand that and convert it back, or maybe just understand that and store it and give it back to us, then, hey, you know what? We're cooking with gas here, all right? Now, let's just take a look at this thing here. Um, 8 bit, 8 bit system would give us 255, sorry, 256 samples from 0 to 55. If you count the zero state, it's going to be 256 possible combinations. Now let's just take a look at this, cancel that, and let's go to, because we have binary, either one or zero, two, to the power of 16. Oh, that gives us 65,000 and 536 possible combinations. Well, that's kind of like 65,536 uh, 65, bits that we could distinguish. Uh, But for some reason, um, the convention is to call this as 64-bit system. Okay, so we have that now. I just want to make sure, yeah, okay. Uh, go back. Oh. All right, shift F5, come on, give us the, uh, give us a PowerPoint presentation back here. All right, so now we have the digital resolution taken care of, all right? Now, analog to digital converter, they come with the ghost converters, ADCs, they come in the form of chips, of, AC, of ICs. I'm not going to go over the, all the pins, because you would have to call up a data sheet on that. But there's, there's a clock input here. There's a read and there's write, uh, you know, and then there's a bunch, uh, bunch of other data terminals here and whatever else the uh, terminals do, you will just have to come, out, uh, come up and, uh, and, and, and get the data sheets on that. On this one here, you can get a whole book. Uh, you can write a whole thousand pages book on how to use that, all right? but. This would take the analog, it would sample the analog signal, and it would give you the data 
right? So data bit zero, data bit one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bit, all right? You can get, every time you sample something, you're going to get eight bit of, uh, um, of the uh, information. So here's a reference voltage. I see, okay, so here's the input voltage, right? Plus and minus. So it's going to sample the voltage and based on what it samples, you can get a digital representation of that sample once you activate that clock or enable that and you push the read or write on it. Uh, you can just, uh, I would encourage you to, to, to get um, and study some of the projects that are involved using this type of thing. Um, as an example, when I was in college, we did um, a simple digital voltmeter using one of these. Go on Google, go on YouTube, um, and get maybe some, maybe some, uh, some projects, like do-it-yourself projects to do. Play with that. Put it on the breadboard. Uh, connect some wires and see if you can make yourself a digital voltmeter using the LED cascaded chip with the LED strips. From Or you can just get a bunch of LEDs. You can get 10 of them. Right? And based on what voltage you're going to, you're going to have you know, from zero to 10 volts. And you see how many LEDs you can light up using that kind of chip. Right? Pretty cool stuff to do. Right? All right, so duck, all right. <laughs> Digital to analog conversion, it just goes the other way, all right. So here we have the digital circuitry, popularly named as the computer system, all right. And here's the digital signal, and that is being fed into a digital to analog converter. And it is going to give us an analog representation of that. All right, so here you would have somebody singing to a microphone and you would produce the microphone transducer would produce the uh, sound wave that will be fed into the analog to digital converter and that sound would be stored in a computer uh, sound wave as a bunch of numbers. Okay. And over here, you get a bunch of numbers being fed into the digital to analog converter, and that could be fed into the audio circuitry. Uh, this one here is called basically a actuator, which would be uh, another way of um, um, naming as a signal processor, or you can say a processor as well, right? Whatever it does, whatever, it, what, what does this one do? Whatever it has to, based on the information and the setup or whatever the equipment has to do, right? So this is a very overall kind of a, a, a conceptual uh, I, uh, conceptual drawing here or, or, or schematic, right? Or flowchart, sort of, right? Uh, okay, so we got uh, the conversion analog to digital, so, uh, uh, DAC, digital to analog conversion, or ADC, uh, which would be the analog to digital conversion. Okay. And there's another example of a chip that would do just that. It would be digital to analog conversion. If you really, really want to get cute about things um, and expand your knowledge, uh, you can... Uh, you can uh, go as far as uh, tackling a little bit more ambitious project of, uh, well, building something on the breadboard, or maybe later on you can make a printed circuit board later on, uh, that would involve uh, just a simple thing uh, to, to convert some sort of analog information to digital and then convert it back to analog. So you would have a sound coming in and you will have all the circuitry that's there, and you will have a sound coming out. Well, you know, it's, you, can only, you can go as far as you want with this thing, right? You can just come to class and listen to the lecture and pass the test, all right? Now, we're going to take care of the differences between microprocessor and the microcontroller. It is kind of important to know, right? 
Um, let's see here. All right. Microprocessor versus microcontroller. And here is the description of microprocessor. Uh, central processing unit right? or microprocessor unit. It's a chip, integrated circuit, IC, which has only the CPU inside central processing unit. It's like a calculator. It just does operations. It doesn't have any memory. It doesn't have anything. It just, it's a very, very, very glorified calculator. Uh, so it only has the processing power. These microprocessors do not have RAM or ROM. Okay, what are these? RAM is, the RAM stands for random access memory and ROM stands for read-only memory. Okay, RAM, random access memory, is a type of memory that you can write and erase and write again and erase and write again and erase. It's just like the uh, the board I'm using. I can write things on the board, right? A, B, and C, all right? Okay, well, but I can erase and, the, and this thing is being stored on that board. Here's that memory here, right? But I can erase that and I can just say C, D, and F, okay? So that would be the, this board here would be a random access memory, right? Now, if I carved something in the rock, I get the hammer and chisel, and I carve that, then this would be, I can only write once onto it, make it, make it so, like uh, you know, Captain Picard, make it so. I'm just a sewing machine. Never mind. Uh, <clears throat> so <laughs> um, you can only write this thing once. And you can only use it as a read-only memory. Yeah. There are things like that. Um, another example, an old, old example of a read-only memory would be if a painter would paint a portrait using paints and canvas. Once the information is there, you can only look at it. You cannot change anything. Yeah, sure, you can change something. You can destroy it, right? But uh, hey, but that serves as a read-only memory. Right. So the microprocessors, it's an integrated circuit which only has the central processing unit and it can only process things. It can add and subtract. Most of the times, you know what, it can add. But adding and shifting and uh, um, it could be manipulated into all kinds of other operations, right? You can compare numbers and do all kinds of wonderful things with the ones and zeros. Uh, the microprocessors don't have RAM and ROM, no. Uh, and any other peripherals on the chip. So it just gets data and it gives a command to do something with it and it does it and it displays it and that's it. You pull the plug on it and it's, it's gone. It's, you know, it's not working. Uh, a system designer has to add the peripherals externally in order to make a functional device. Okay, put that in the back burner for a couple of seconds here. Applications, so the applications of microprocessor, applications of microprocessors include desktop PCs, laptops, notepads, and pretty much anything, even your refrigerator has a microprocessor in it. Cars, anything that processes any numbers will have some form of maybe more or less complicated, but it would be a microprocessor. Right? Your wristwatch inside has a microprocessor in it. Right? And here are the examples of Intel Pentium microprocessors. Your cell phone has a microprocessor in it. It's just much smaller than that. And uh, over here, what we have is uh, at Mega 328. Well, microchip, it's a microprocessor. That's the micro microprocessor that's being used in your Arduino board. All right, so now let's, let's move on to the microcontrollers. Microcontroller um, is a chip that has the microcontroller unit is a chip or integrated circuit that has the central processing unit, which would be 
it's a well integrated circuit so it's not a chip anymore so this would be integrated circuit that has many components that has a cpu central processing unit which would be this guy right here right so uh and it also has other peripherals all embedded on a single chip or circuit, I should say. At times, uh, let's say it is also termed or named as a mini computer or a computer on a single chip. You could have microcontroller in this form as well. Or it could, it could look like this. It could look like this as far as shape. It could look like this. That's basically that, that with the cover off, right? Uh, now, a uh, wide range of features are available in different versions, uh, depending on what kind of microcontroller somebody does, uh, there will be different devices, right? Some manufacturers of microcontrollers will be Amtel, Microchip, blah, 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 Philips, Motorola, Texas Instruments, and I just added a little Arduino here. And there's that good one, there's a big one, that et cetera, does it too, okay? Uh, so this whole big thing, this whole device that has a microprocessor in it, and it has other circuitries here, is the crystal that provides the clock. Here's the USB input, here's the power input, here are the inputs and outputs, pins, and thus there are some capacitors in it, and what not, LEDs and traces and buttons, this whole thing composes into a microcontroller. Right? And microcontroller uses microprocessor and just builds around it to make something that is supposed to function in a certain way. Now, when you do the labs using the um, Arduino, I think there were a couple of last labs that you did. Yes, you did. Uh, using the Arduino board, can you use this just, just using the microprocessor? Yes, you can. You could, but you would have to add the necessary parts for the particular function. You would have to add them yourself. So all the resistors, all the LEDs, all the, all the uh, uh, capacitors and whatnot, and maybe push button, that whatever, whatever you need. And there are some people um that actually experiment with that they just have fun with this um well for example if you want to make certain device that does something um it has certain purpose and you start with uh, getting the arduino board for example and then you come up with the program uh, the code or the sketch as they call it in the arduino uh, world uh, and uh, you decide that you're going to use pin 3, 4, and 17. Oh, there's no 17, whatever. Uh, and then uh, all the other stuff is not going to be used. But if you want to do this thing into a mass production, then you would just skim it down to the only necessary parts that are needed. And you would use just the microprocessor and a couple of resistors or maybe cap capacitors and LEDs or whatnot uh, that you don't need to have all the other stuff. So yes, you can do the labs. You could do the labs with just the at mega processor, um, microprocessor, but you would have to build things around it. It would be just more complicated. Okay. So the difference between microcontroller and microprocessor, microcontroller is the whole device that uses microprocessor in order to accomplish something that is going to function a certain way. Right. So the last slide, that's the last slide. All right, uh, so PLCs, okay? Now we're not gonna go into the details of the PLCs, but because there, uh, there, uh, there are many, many versions of PLCs. There's not just one kind of a PLC. You know? um, it's just like, uh, can you cook food? Right? Well, what kind of food? You know? So this is the same thing, PLCs, it's a programmable logic controller, PLC. A specialized computer used for industrial automa automatic control, for industrial automation, 
So whatever the production line is, whatever the production process is, there would be a PLC designed specifically for that. Right? So just the overall, overall analysis of this system that we have at hand here, on the left side, we have the input module. And on the right side, we have the output module. So the input module is, well, Sometimes it's required to sense certain conditions of something. Is the bottle green? Yes, accept it. Is the bottle red? No, throw it out. Okay. Ah, yes, that would be the bottle sorting uh, factory, for example. Uh, so whatever it does, it has a bunch of sensors, and this is represented by, by a bunch of switches right here, just to make things more simpler. Right? Uh, now, so the input feeds the central processing unit, and there would be a bunch of microcontrollers in there programmed here, certain way to perform certain functions. If it doesn't have a program, this thing is a boat anchor, not a very good one, right? So um, uh, it has the central processing unit, it has memory in it, so we can store the data and retrieve it at the, you know, whenever you need that uh, to be retrieved. Where's my mouse? Here it is. And uh, over here that whatever the processing is supposed to do, it is feeding the output module. Now, this input module and this output module has also a bunch of central processing unit inside as well. So it's a whole world. It's just it's this rabbit hole goes deep and deep and it never ends, right? So. Uh, but uh, but on in overall uh, in the overall understanding this would be uh, this would be it and the whole thing is fed by a power supply and of course the program is uh, provided by the programming device it could be a human interface or it could be just a, um, something something automatic that is going to enter the program in there and of course the output uh, device the output module would control output devices, right? So here it would be some sort of a signal line. This would be a motor uh, load, or a, uh, this looks like a light bulb, or a, that looks like a dog's food bulb. But uh, no, that's uh, that looks like maybe a speaker, a loudspeaker, or something like that. Right? It's just kind of uh, uh, as that represents different type of mo uh, devices that are being controlled by the module, right? So that's pretty much it for uh, uh, for, uh, for 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 today, and uh, that would that would be the last uh, that would be the last class that we had. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, I'm going to release the uh, I'm going to release the assignment number ten, which was going to be uh, a, some what's well, a sheet of questions that are going to uh, answer on the same basis that we did uh, all the other assignments. And uh, later on today, um, today's Tuesday, um, Wednesday afternoon, the latest, okay, I'm going to release the last test and the test is going to cover just the materials that we did since uh, Mrs. Hashemi and I came on board uh, to teach this class. You will find some information, uh, some questions about the labs that you have done, or you will have some questions about the theory content that we have covered uh, and it's going to be an online open book test um, so you can refer to all the post-it notes you can refer to all the youtube videos that we did you can refer to your lab notes you can talk to each other you can consult each other just make sure you do this thing by yourself because this way you're actually learning if you don't do this by yourself if you cheat on this thing Technically, I could say I don't care, but I'm not allowed to say that, right? But I'll just tell you that it doesn't affect me directly. It affects you directly. So here's my big motivational speech. If you cheat that, you're cheating on, on, on nobody else but yourself. And even if you cheat and you get a better mark, what are you going to do with that? You can hang it on your fridge, all right? Uh, so, uh, and then you won't be able to do a job uh, if you don't learn things properly. Okay, but I'm pretty sure you already know that, right? So I'm not going to give you a third degree lecture on that.
Anyways, um, that's uh, that's that wraps it up, guys. Uh, anybody uh, has any questions about anything that we have done so far, or what's going to be on the test? Or the yeah, this is not an exam. Oh yeah, the test. Once it's released, you're going to have till the end of Friday, to so to Friday midnight, uh, eleven fifty nine p.m. to complete that, and it's going to be on the same basis, just like we did the last test. If nobody has anything to add, then uh, again, the email channel is open. Contact me anytime you need, uh, and I'll do my darnest to respond to you as fast as I can. All right, cool. How many people we have left? We have 10 people left. All right. These are the diehard fans here. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you. And thank you for being the students. You were great. All right. And I hope I will be able to see you maybe teaching other subjects uh, as we go along in our college. All right. Have a good one, guys. And all the best. Enjoy the rest of the summer.